The United States Border Patrol has exciting and rewarding career opportunities with the nation's largest law enforcement organization. Border Patrol agents enjoy great pay, outstanding federal benefits, and up to $20,000 in recruitment incentives. If you are looking for a way to serve something greater than yourself, consider the U.S. Border Patrol. Learn more online at cbp.gov slash careers slash USBP. That's cbp.gov slash careers slash USBP. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On The Verge. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Thelman and Nick Stevens. And we've got a lot to get into on tonight's show as we're joined by right-handed pitcher Chase McDermott of the Orioles Farm System. And we're going to get into the latest news from spring training. But as we always like to do at the top of the show, we want to welcome a new member of our Patreon community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Uh, just a quick reminder that you can sign up for Patreon for as little as th- Patreon for as little as three dollars a month. Have access to our WhatsApp group, and at our five and ten dollar levels, have bonus daily content from us throughout the season. And someone has. Uh, just joined our community, so we want to give them a shout out now. Yeah, thanks for buying me that extra minute there to pull that up. Um, welcome <laughs> aboard, Gerard Balak. I appreciate your support, and welcome to the family. And with that, I'll introduce tonight's guest. He, he was selected out of Ball State University in the fourth round of the 2021 draft by the Houston Astros, and then was traded to the Orioles last summer as part of the three-team deal that sent Trey Mancini to Houston. He would then pitch in Aberdeen and Bowie before the season was over, and he's now gearing up for his first full season in the Orioles farm system. He's Chase McDermott. Chase, how are you? Good. How about yourself? Good. Uh, thank you for taking the time out as uh, spring training you know, gears up for on the minor league side to join us. You had an eventful first full season of pro ball, beginning the year in the Astros organization, then being traded to the Orioles and ultimately reaching double A. When you look back at last season, where do you feel like you excelled the most? Um, I think the place I excelled the most was just uh, learning to get pitches to move a little bit more. Um, In college, I kind of got away with using the fastball a lot. And last year, I got to use a bunch of different pitches, learn new pitches, all that kind of stuff. So I think that was the area I most improved in. What was your. Definitely definitely noticed the movement on those pitches. They're crazy. (laughs) Appreciate that. Yeah, I think one of the first times I remember watching you sitting down and really watching one of your starts, it was like a, a fastball you threw. And I think I, I messaged these guys and they were like, this ball literally explodes when it reaches the point. Um, but uh, what was your initial reaction after finding out you were being traded to Baltimore? And how familiar were you with the organization already at that time? Uh, yeah, I mean, my first reaction was kind of shock, I guess. I mean, obviously, it's a business. It's always a part of um, it could always happen to you. Um, but you don't really expect it in your first full season. Um, but, I mean, once once it kind of all settled in, I was super excited to become a part of the org. Um, I honestly didn't know a ton about the org at the time, um, but just getting to be here and learn all the new stuff and all the great players that have played here in the past and all that kind of stuff has been a real treat. So, And, you know, Michael Elias comes from the Astros. Was there any similarities? Was it Did that make it an easier transition to go from, obviously, it's a different front office now than when he was there, but... 
is it a little little more similar than maybe coming from like the Miami Marlins, just a random team? Yeah, for sure. I think there's definitely some similarities. Obviously, differences. Um, every org is different, but um, there's definitely some similarities that helped uh, the transition just be a little bit smoother. So, yeah, and I think one change that you probably appreciated was getting out of uh, Asheville, right? It was the yeah, a little sure. hitter friendly there, and then you go to Aberdeen, which is a little more pitcher friendly. Yeah, for sure. It was nice uh, not having to throw there anymore. So, But while Asheville is a challenging environment, obviously, for pitchers, do you feel like you learned some things having to pitch in that environment that could help you make, make you successful in the future? Yeah, for sure. I think it uh, made me kind of figure out how to pitch people a little bit different. Um, like lefties that are pole happy um, at that field are a real threat because it's 297 down the right field line. So you have to try to avoid staying away from them, get weak contact on the ground, that kind of stuff. And then righties that like to slap the ball the other way can even do damage there. So finding a way to get out of that kind of stuff kind of helped me transition into different aspects of the game. So that should fit well when you're playing in uh, Yankee Stadium and uh, Fenway Park over there. That'll, that'll help you out a lot there. <laughs> Um, your fastball is a pitch that really stands out uh, for its velocity, for its movement. Um, how has it developed over the years, and what adjustments have you made to it since you got into pro ball? Uh, yeah, that's kind of one of the things is that I haven't really messed with a whole lot. Um, granted, I mean, when I graduated high school, I was like 87 to 89 on a good day. Now it's 2 to 5, 3 to 6. That kind of stuff can get up to 98. So the velo kind of came just as i got older and that kind of stuff um but i've always kind of let it ride through the zone a little bit better i've always kind of been a top rail guy that kind of stuff um so i haven't had to change that very much but um just trying to shorten up the arm path a little bit to make it more consistent command commanded a little bit better that kind of stuff has been a key focus this off season what about the secondaries or any particular focus on secondary pitches this off season? One that maybe in particular you uh, focus on a little bit more than others. Uh, yeah. Don't want to give too much away, obviously, but yeah. uh, scrap the change up. Um, and then now throwing a splitter um, okay. instead, um, just more comfortable for me to throw change up was a tough pitch for me to execute in the sense of I supinate better than I pronate. So change ups are hard to get to. Um, and then the sweep slider, um, everyone always talks about, I shouldn't say everyone always talks about, but when people talk about my slider, I technically throw two sliders now, um, a shorter slider and then a sweep slider. So those were probably the two main focuses of getting movement with them and being able to locate with them. And when we talked to Cade Povich a couple of weeks ago and we had mentioned how, you know, they, the Orioles didn't really make many adjustments with him after the trade since there was only, what, a couple months left of the season and they really got to work in the off season. Was that your experience as well? Yeah, for sure. They kind of let me, um, well, just a little backstory, not backstory, but when I was with the Astros, I kind of changed some things. Um, I felt like it was, I don't want to say it was hindering me in any way, but it was, I didn't feel like it was comfortable for me. Um, especially when I got to double A, I struggled a little bit in my first two outings. And then me and Conway, who was the pitching coach at the time, we kind of just talked and he was like, go back to what makes you feel comfortable. Um, and he let me do what I wanted to do those last couple of starts. And get through it that way and then once the off season hit we started really focusing on things that i need to worry about so yeah that's cool and you've only been in organization now a few months even though it seems like longer now that it's the calendar's turned over a whole new season about to get started but what about how the organization goes about developing pitchers has stood out to you in your time here if anything yeah i mean definitely things have stood out uh, the main thing is like i just said um, some teams are definitely more like we want you to do one thing and if you don't do that one thing it may be wrong in their eyes um i can sit there and talk to whoever and tell them what i'm seeing um and they'll tell me what they're seeing we'll kind of try to find like a compromise in between um obviously there's some things like if i came in and was like i'm gonna throw a knuckleball instead of a fastball that's not gonna play but like to an extent they're gonna let me try to feel out some things for myself um, and go from there might be something to throw batters off every once in a while. I'm just saying. That's what I'm saying. I would pick throw one. I've tried it. It does not work. So. <laughs> what was that uh, move up from high A to double A like? You had been in high A all year. How Just how different are the hitters between the two levels? Uh, I think there's definitely a jump. Um, I mean, even in high A, I think people, 
you kind of look at it from the outside and you see I and you think, oh, there's not anyone down there. But I mean, faced some really good players in high A this year. So some I eventually saw again in like Indy Rodriguez and double A. I saw him in high A too at the start of the year, that kind of stuff. Um, so stuff like that is just, I mean, you kind of see some same guys, but you definitely see more, I would say, experienced guys that understand when to take pitches, when to lay off certain things, um, when to attack certain pitches, all that kind of stuff. So there's a jump, but I wouldn't say it's like some insane thing. It's just finding a way to manage those certain counts and stuff like that. A little bit of personal background. You come from a basketball family. Your mother was a college basketball player. Um, your brother has played in the NBA. You played basketball up until high school, I believe, and then pivoted completely to baseball. What was, uh, was that a hard decision for you? Uh, no, not at all, actually. Played my freshman year um, in high school on the JV team. Um, I was really small at the time. I was like 5'6", 110 pounds as a freshman. Um, went into my freshman year of baseball, was really enjoying it. Um, ended up having elbow surgery as a freshman in high school. Not Tommy John, just uh, some. I was growing way too fast and my arm didn't like me throwing that kind of stuff. Um, but once I kind of got into baseball and then got hurt too, I was like, this is what I want to do. Like if I'm going to play this, like I got to take the time now and focus on it. Well, when you went off to college, you pitched at Ball State and I mean, they're, they're a pitching factory down there. I don't know if under the radar is the right term or what, but there are a lot of former pitchers, a lot of pitchers that come out of Ball State in pro ball right now. What is it about that program that leads so many arms like yourself to become successful at the next level? Uh, I think it's just kind of the, there's a lot of things, but I think the the great coaching, I mean, with Coach Maloney, Coach Maloney's been coaching for a long time. He's seen some really great players, so he has a lot of experience on that end. Um, and then I had, I got recruited by um, Coach Fetter, who's now the big league pitching coach with the Tigers. Um, and then Dustin Glant was there for my first two years. Um, and I really liked him just in the sense of he was super fiery, and that's kind of how I am too. Um, so just rolling with that and him teaching me a bunch of stuff that he knew from Pro Bowl and all that kind of stuff was helpful. Um, and then my last two years, I had Larry Scully, who was a great guy, super knowledgeable about things. One of the guys that I could talk to and figure out what I was doing wrong, he would help me with stuff, but he'd also let me be my own person. Um, so that was all kind of great, the coaching side. But it's also, um, I mean, we get great players like Dre Jameson and Kyle Nicholas were both in my class, obviously got drafted in three separate years, but we all came in together. Um, so that little competition between the three of us was always super helpful trying to develop and everything. Um, but you also just, I mean, you have guys that, are trying to prove themselves. Ball State isn't a powerhouse by any means. I think they're, I think there's a chance they'll get there in the future. Um, but as when we got there, it wasn't a powerhouse. So we were trying to prove ourselves and prove that we could play at a higher level than most people thought. Yeah, that actually touched on uh, one of our patrons had a question. They wanted to ask Vivek. Uh, shout out to Vivek. He specifically wanted to know what it was like pitching in that same rotation as Dre Jamison and Kyle Nicholas when you were in college. Yeah, it was insane. I mean, we all came in together and. Um, I ended up having Tommy John my freshman year, so I didn't get to pitch with them, but I got to watch them every day and watch how they operate and that kind of thing. And I mean, Kyle and Dre were both hitting 100 as sophomores. Dre may have hit it as a freshman, actually, but they're both throwing super hard. They're both striking guys out. And just getting to watch that kind of helped me, I guess, just develop as a person and as a player. Um, but it was great. I mean, there was always little competitions going on and that kind of stuff, so. Your last couple of questions for me. Uh, is there anything in particular you've been focusing on this offseason to prepare for 2023? I mean, we've talked about how much your stuff moves. It's it's probably hard to really locate it exactly where you want it to go. But is that a, a focus, the the command a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that was a big thing last year, like I said, too, was the command or the getting all the movements. Um, so sometimes walks were just a price of that. Um, and then it kind of floated throughout the season where, I was trying to make things too nasty instead of just throwing it and trusting it. Um, so that was a big thing this offseason was just trusting it, finding a way to locate it. Like I said, getting my arm on time. So everything's consistent with delivery and all that kind of stuff too. So that was a big focus was getting all those commanded better. Yeah, that makes sense. And no one ever answers this question, but um, any long-term goals for 2023 that you want to at least internally make as far as how far you want to go? You want to get to AAA in the rotation, maybe a cup of coffee in the majors? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I could sit here and say I want to be the number one by the end of the season, but obviously that's probably not going to happen. I just want to I just want to go out and compete and prove myself a little bit um, in the sense of that I can command the ball, I can still get strikeouts, I can help the team win, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that will just lead me through the system if that works out. And so that's kind of my goal is just go out and compete every day and be better than last year. Actually, I just I thought of one more. Um, what's better in your eyes, uh, stay in the starting as a starting pitcher in the rotation or just be a fireball and closer at some point in the majors? I mean, I would love to start. Obviously, I've always been a starter, so I'd rather start. But, I mean, I don't – if if I get moved to the bullpen and that ends up with becoming a fireball closer or something like that, then I'm fine with that too. So. Yeah, that sounds fun as well. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one of our favorite questions to ask, I think a lot of listeners enjoy this as well, is uh, some uh, scouting reports of your teammates from uh, the players themselves. And in your time at Aberdeen and Bowie, and you're at camp now down there in Sarasota, um, is there a pitcher or two, your teammates, that if you rolled a reverse and you were a hitter, that's the last guy you want to see out there on the mound? Oh, I mean, I could go through a list just being, <laughs> I mean, that was a great thing last year was getting to watch all the talent um, after being traded. Um, there was so much that I can't even begin to talk about everyone. But, I mean, there are guys that, especially certain pitches, like Xavier Moore's changeup is one of the first ones that comes to mind. That that pitch I would never want to get in the box against. Um, Arm Brewster's fastball is elite. Um, I mean, like I said, Cade, Cade's cutter last year was ridiculous. Um, I mean, Cade as a whole last year was really good. Um, but especially the cutter, I mean, it was just an elite-level pitch. So, there's a lot of guys that I would not want to step in the box against. Granted, I can't hit, so that makes it easier. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, there's a lot of good good guys that I want to really want to get in the box against if I was a hitter. So you're glad they instituted the universal DH? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I've, I probably consistently since like my sophomore year of high school. So it's been it's been about seven, eight years, something like that. So. You uh, have also played with a lot of good hitters in your time in the Orioles farm system. Who do you think would be the toughest guy to face if you had to face if he got in the box against you? Again, I mean, that's hard to get – just pick one person. Um, but, I mean, the two that really come to mind – or I guess three last year um, when I was in A, especially were Colton Kowser, uh, Joey Ortiz, and Connor Norby. I mean, watching them, it was – I was kind of sitting there thinking sometimes, like, I wonder if like he can actually get out. Like I didn't think <laughs> there was a game where I think Colton had four, went four for four with four of the weakest hit singles I've ever seen, and then the next game actually ended up. I think it was the next game hit a home run probably 440 feet, and I was just like, Man, "There's nothing he really can't do." So, I mean, there were some great hitters. I can go on a list again, but those three kind of stand out in my mind. So. Love it. Before we wrap up, we do have a couple of listener questions. Um, we'll go back to Vivek here. Given all of your strikeouts last year, will you accept the nickname Chase McStrikeouts? I mean, whatever <laughs> they can call me, I'm not going to be picky about nicknames. So He's been calling your brother McBuckets in, the, in our WhatsApp group? Yeah, uh, McBuckets was a name he got at Butler for a while, too, so I've heard that one before. I nice. said you should be McChase since you make the, the hitters chase your uh, sweep and slider and stuff like, I like that. One too. Like I said, I'm not picky. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever nickname sticks, I'm cool with. Nice. And last listener question here from Charles. Uh, Charles want to know if you know, what you can talk about here. What are some of the differences and, and similarities you, you've seen so far between the, the Astros, the way the Astros were developing you and the way the Orioles have been so far? You kind of touched on that a little bit. But just kind of generally speaking, what are some things that maybe stood out to you? Yeah, like I said earlier, I kind of don't want to get too in depth with this. You yeah. don't want to not looking out anyone or anything. So, um, but I would say the biggest thing is kind of that like compromise level of obviously coaches spent all this time looking at data and all this different stuff to give us the best chance. Um, but we can also, I feel like here we can kind of say, hey, I don't think that's going to work for me, or I can throw it a couple times like this doesn't feel comfortable. We'll try to make adjustments to it, whatever it is. Um, so I think that'd be the biggest difference I've noticed so far um, is just kind of a little bit more freedom in the sense of letting us do what's comfortable while also trying to get us to that next level. Um, I mean, there's obviously other things, but there's not huge differences where it's like I'm watching guys 
that only throw from a certain arm angle with one team or something like that. So, Well, Chase, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Best of luck the rest of camp and uh, into the regular season. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thank man. you. Chase McDermott, uh, mm-hmm. Orioles minor league pitcher. So yes. some interesting insight from him there. And I feel like this is a guy that the three of us really see as a potential breakout candidate this year to the extent that he kind of broke out a little bit last year. But it feels like there is another year or two that we could see this year. Yeah, definitely got a better appreciation of, I mean, he was a name that I knew he had good stuff, was striking out a lot of batters with the Astros, but actually watching him pitch consistently in the second half, it was like eye-opening how good the stuff was. And it's like, if this guy can get this under control at all, he's going to be at least an elite bullpen arm. And it's pretty exciting just to hear that they've already made changes where now he's got a hard slider, a sweeping slider, ditched the change up for a splitter. So this is going to be very fun to watch here early on this season. Yeah, I I mean, I've mentioned before, I – that one random i think it was covid year so i was like really bored and desperate for for some baseball activity uh and i ended up writing about like the uh mid-american conference mac college baseball for like a half a season or so and ball state was a team that i watched a lot of and he was on that roster then and i mean that that whole entire rotation like he mentioned with dre jameson Kyle nicholas and himself an entire pitching staff john baker another name on, in that pitching staff uh he was an exciting name exciting arm to watch down there in college and he looks much bigger and much stronger now already in the big leagues um and you know he's he really hasn't pitched that much like he doesn't have a ton of mileage under his arm he's a little bit older but he mentioned the tommy john surgery you had the covid year in college he really had like one full ish season at ball state is like 80 something innings i'm look i pulled up his page here only 20 innings last year uh in pro ball after the draft so yeah, I mean, he's, he's a younger arm son, maybe not age-wise, but as far as mileage goes, he's, he's a younger arm who racks up the strikeouts. And uh, excited to see what he can do starting in double A next year. Exactly. There's 125 innings under his belt of the season and a half in the minor leagues and only 139 across three seasons at Ball, St- at Ball State. So not a lot of mileage. And so you feel like with McDermott, some of the adjustments he's making this year, hopefully that does pay off because – that fastball is something else. And the fact that he's got two different sliders that he can work with, to me, makes him really interesting to follow this year. Yeah, if anyone hasn't watched him on minor league baseball, just get a good camera angle. You see that fastball, it'll be like, okay, it's normal fastball. Oh, wait, it just went up at the last second, and the guy swung right through it. So it's fun to watch. He said the key word, too, uh, sweeper. Uh, so I think he's another one of those guys that the Orioles got a hold of to add sweep to that slider. Um yeah, it was, should have asked him about the Hoppy fastball, too. Yeah. I want to <laughs> rest in peace, Hoppy. Fastball. <laughs> I know, I thought about that just now. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and it's cool to know because we know obviously the yeah. Orioles love teaching the change up, but it's cool to know also, hey, it wasn't working for this guy, so let's ditch it. We'll go to splitter grip and we'll make that work as well. Yeah, he's not the first pitcher that's come on the show and said that, um, you know, the Orioles, their willingness to listen to the players. That's that's something that I just I love. Um, it, it's not here. We're going to do this 5000 times in practice because this is what I did 40 years ago when I was pitching or as I was hitting. It's they're really going to sit down with these players and listen. All right. Did that feel good? Did that not feel good? What do you want to do with this uh, guy? And they're gonna there's back and forth there's communication both ways and I, I think that's awesome i think that helps the players feel more comfortable feel more confident um you know you talk all the time about all the former teachers that are in this organization and as a former teacher myself like there's a lot of those same strategies that you employ in the classroom to you know bring out the best in students the orioles are doing that here on the baseball field and yeah i'm, I'm excited to see some pitchers really really start to pop next year because we really don't hear a lot about you know we see what Kowser and Adley and Gunner do and, and all these hitters, but I'm excited for more of these pitchers like McDermott to pop this year. So maybe the can start getting a little bit more respect. Yeah. And obviously the Orioles have a, a type of pitcher they like, they have a type of way they like to develop these guys, but at the same time, yeah, they're willing to listen and, and go with what's going to work best. They're not going to try to force a round peg into a square hole or vice versa. I forget how the saying goes. Yeah, it's uh, really encouraging to hear that. And hopefully we see McDermott and a lot of these pitchers take off this year. And speaking of pitching talent, we got to see Grayson Rodriguez last week, and he looked sharp in his outing on Thursday against the Detroit Tigers. 
pitching two scoreless innings with a strikeout and a walk. Rodriguez right now seems to have the inside track for one of the five rotation spots on opening day. So kind of some question marks because he missed a lot of time with the injury last year. He came back towards the end of the season, and while he looked good, I think that most would agree the stuff wasn't quite where it was in June. However, that outing last Thursday, he did look pretty sharp. So, Bob, um, now that Rodriguez has gotten that first outing in, we're going to see him build up his innings in camp. What are your thoughts? What a Christmas miracle. The stuff that was diminished so badly last year is back and better than ever. No, um, Yeah, obviously – you know, he, I, we've talked about it, but the fact that maybe his stuff wasn't quite as sharp, the velocity, the velocity wasn't quite what it was before the injury at the end of last year, a year, but he must have known, look, you're going to get these innings in, but sorry, you're, you're not going to get up to the major league level until next year. I'm sure that had something to do with it. Plus just, you know, rebounding from the injury and in, as itself in, in general, clearly he came in a camp rearing and ready to prove that he belongs in the opening day rotation and I think he's pretty much proved that this stuff sounds like it was ridiculous we didn't get to see it but we did get the, the stat cast data and what was he averaging like 98 miles per hour on the fastball sounds pretty good for a first time out uh, yeah get him stretched out I'm sure he'll be like four or five inning starts at least in the beginning of the year but it's just exciting that after one start it's like yeah he's a lock he's going to be in the, the opening day rotation yeah, that, that looked like the Grayson Rodriguez, statistically speaking. This is the, what the Grayson Rodriguez that we saw like before pre-injury. Like you said, we haven't been able to watch him. Haven't been able to watch much of these guys. But um, you know, it was a March 2nd outing against the Detroit Tigers. Uh, so take that for what it is. But like you said, we did get the stat cast data at least. And he's out there on first spring outing, topping out at 98.9 miles an hour. Averaging 98, like Bob said. So, like, he's fully healthy. If there were any questions about his health, I, I think he answered those. Only 21 pitches to get through the two innings of work. Seven called strikes plus whiffs, so 33% CSW percentage. You want to see that above, like, 30%. I think that was the, the good benchmark you want to see there for reference. So, I mean, a really good afternoon and only one hard hit ball, and that was Miguel Cabrera hit the only hard hit ball against him, and that ended up being a double play. Wiped out the walk that he had in that inning, I believe. So, yeah, it's like there's still a, a while to go before the regular season starts. Feels like it's close, but when you're playing spring training games every single day, you still got a while, and it's going to be a long rookie year for him. So, like, but you could not ask for a better start to spring from Grayson Rodriguez. Put some of those happen. numbers in the context. Rodriguez had three of the hardest fastballs recorded by Statcast in that game. As Nick mentioned, topping out at ninety-eight point nine miles per hour. Um, we didn't get, you know, we don't have a ton of data on the secondaries, but by all reports from people who were there, they did look good. So you feel like we know what his stuff can be. We know he has elite ace level stuff. And it's a matter of whether or not in this first full season back after missing time last year, it's going to be there for him. And so far, it looks like it's going to be. And I would expect that, first off, I think he's definitely making the rotation. Um, I think it would be a huge upset if he doesn't. But I would expect that, you know, maybe he goes through a little bit of an adjustment period when he gets to the majors. Maybe walks are a little high in the beginning because that sometimes does happen with pitchers. But it gives me confidence that he's going to settle in at some point, get comfortable, and the difference he can make in this rotation really is a difference maker in my mind of how far the Orioles are going to go this year. If they're going to be better than they were last year, it's probably going to be because Grayson Rodriguez comes up and pitches his way into the rookie of the year conversation. Yeah, and I'm sure he's going to have his moments where – you know, he looks the part of a rookie pitcher, but maybe not as many as we might have thought a couple of weeks ago before seeing how he, he went out and looked in his first outing. And maybe, you know, he's a little amped up. He didn't have the best uh, first major league spring training appearance last year when he got only, what was it, one inning, and I don't think yeah. it went very well. So maybe he was a little extra amped up early on. So maybe the velocity will kind of settle in a little bit lower, but I don't know, man. I think he's got a chance to be really special right from jump in 2023. Yeah. I mean, looking at his projections, 
they have him averaging out his fan graphs has what like 50 different projection systems here so i mean he's projections have him averaging about 118 innings this season i i have a hard time seeing him like blowing past that number i don't have a number in mind exactly but he only had 94 innings in 2019 and only 103 in 2021 and then 75 last season so i don't see him blowing up to like 160 175 innings I honestly, I don't want to open up a whole other can of worms here, but um, I also don't think that the organization believes this isn't a hot take at all, but I don't think the organization believes that 2023 is the year that like the World Series is the ultimate goal. So I think that's another reason why you probably gonna see the phantom IL stance. You're going to see him Arm skip fatigue, a start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, little stuff that not to be concerned. It's he's just taking some time. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, it's fine. And, and I was actually going back and listening to, I'm because I'm an idiot. I don't know why I wasn't subscribed to Rates and Barrels, uh, Eno Sayers, and the Athletic Podcast. But uh, I'm over here drafting best ball fantasy baseball teams without the, the wise words of Eno in my ear uh, to back it up. But I'm going back and listening to the, the position previews. And they're talking about shortstop Bobby Witt Jr. And I mean, he they kind of mentioned he had like a 99 WRC plus last year, his first full year in the majors. And in a lot of statistical categories, Bobby Witt Jr. was kind of league average, maybe a tick above league average. But they talked about how he was a rookie in Major League Baseball, and that's really good. Uh, so, like, if Grayson Rodriguez is is this meets this projection of around a two WAR pitcher, two to two and a half WAR pitcher his rookie year, I'll take that. I mean, how many Orioles pitchers have we seen climb two WAR over the last five six years? Like three, maybe. Um, so Especially. yeah. <laughs> When you consider he's going to top out at, I'd say no more than 140 innings. Like that seems like the very top end of a projection you can make. So yeah, just imagine when he's got a year or two under his belt and he can just let it rip all season long. I mean, yeah, future's bright. Future's bright. We knew that already. A two win season and only 118 innings would be really impressive Um, because that's not a ton of time. I agree with you, Nick. I think that there's going to be a lot of, you know, I don't want to say bumps in the road, but there's going to be times where he skips a start or maybe there is an IL stint somewhere along the line. Some of that is because you've got to protect the guy that is so key to your future. And it's not just about year one. It's about what you're going to get out of him in years four, five, and six. And hopefully maybe a little bit past that um, when this team probably is going to be at that level of contending for the World Series. But there is short-term value to it as well because if you are making a push for the playoffs, you want him getting a start. Um, that's good for the team, and it's good for his development because then when you get into 2024, 2025, when you see him as that guy at the front of the rotation for a team that's one of the best in the American League or aspiring to be one of the best in the American League, that you know, wild card game outing in 2023 will have helped him in some way. Yeah, that was the only other point that I was going to bring up is that it, you know they're not doing this to like baby him and keep him at 110 innings or you know barely 100 innings or whatever. It, they're doing it also because you do want him pitching in a playoff stretch. If you got a must win game and he's been as good as we think he can be this year, if he's pitching well and holding his own you want him making that start at Camden Yards against the, the Yankees or Red Sox or whoever it is in a must-win AL East game, uh, or you want him in that playoff rotation. So, yeah, that's going to play a factor into it as well because the World Series may not be the ultimate goal, is, but, I mean, you set the bar pretty high last year uh, that it's you've got to make the playoffs this year, I, I think. Um, or there may be even more riots in the streets down there. But, yeah, it's – yeah, it's it, – like you said, if he's only throwing 118, 120 innings, but he can be a two, two and a half war pitcher, Orioles fans, and, and all the data looks good. He's averaging, you know, 97, 98 miles an hour on the fastball. He's missing bats. He's not walking guys. That's a, a huge foundation to build on. Next year, when the gloves are off, he's full go. Maybe we've got a, another ace in a trade or a free agency or whatever, and this rotation is looking really good. Then we get really excited. So while Rodriguez – is probably going to be in the opening day rotation. We now know that D.L. Hall will not. Brandon Hyde revealed late last week that because of Hall's timeline coming back from an injury, he's not going to be able to stretch out in spring training to the point where he could start 
from day one. However, that does not close the door on Hall making the opening day roster. We just now know that if D.L. Hall is going to begin this season in the major leagues, it's going to be in the bullpen. So, Nick, I'll start with you on this one. I don't think it was terribly surprising to hear that news because we knew that Hall had had an injury issue. But what, do you think right now the better scenario, neither of which is ideal, but is the better scenario to let him go back to Norfolk and start? Or if he's healthy towards the end of camp, put him in the bullpen? I don't know. I don't I don't think my thoughts have changed since last time we kind of touched on this, that I've kind of resigned to the thinking that it may be better that he starts the year in Norfolk if you really like his potential as a starter. It appears based on comments that the organization does. And especially like if you keep seeing guys in spring training like Michael Bauman, Andrew Politi, even Spencer Watkins, some other guys we'll talk about more later on. If these guys continue to step up and spring like they have so far, then why would you put – I don't see a need to rush Hall back in that bullpen immediately when – you know, I think Zach hit the nail on the head there in, in the show notes with the note of saying, hey, go st- stick around in Sarasota. We're going to build you up in Sarasota for, you know, two, three weeks. And then you go to Norfolk. Wait, we'll put you in Norfolk's rotation. And if you pitch there as well as he did last year, he's back in the majors, what, maybe two months into the season? Uh, maybe sooner if he's pitching really well. But, like, my opinion that he can be a major league starter has not changed. I know the potential outcomes are pretty wide and they're varied, but I believe in the stuff and I believe in his ability to overcome those challenges. He's one of the guys that I would not bet against that attitude on the mound. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think I've kind of resigned to the fact that go ahead and start in Norfolk's rotation and hopefully we see you in the majors two, three months into the season. Now that he doesn't have his long hair to keep him off balance, I think that control is going to get way better. <laughs> but uh, no, well, I, I... – I can't get the idea of him and Grayson just having a tandem to start the year, build them up to three or four innings, and then just let them lose together. I mean, that would be so much fun. But at the same time, like you said, guys that we're going to talk about in a little bit are really looking good. And if you want to give them a chance early on while at the same time getting Dale Hall a chance to build up completely and, you know, just get some confidence, get his feet wet for the season down in AAA – and have him at the ready, then I I don't think that's a bad option either. Like, I know we're about to talk about them. I want to say their names so bad, but uh, yeah, some of these guys that are going to be in the bullpen or in like the fringes of the competition, I really want to see what they can do at the major league level early on. And you know, Michael Elias is going to pick someone off the waiver wire when cuts start happening. Someone's going to come in to kind of throw all this, uh, another wrench into this plan as well, but there is an argument to be made that the best short-term solution for the Orioles competitiveness is to put Hall in the bullpen this year, because if you look at your other options among left-handers, there's no question that Hall has the best stuff in that group. And in fact, overall, Felix Batista might be the only guy you'd put ahead of him as a reliever. Um, And, you know, there You could do what Bob said and you could piggyback him or you could decide, all right, for this year, he is a reliever. He's going to pitch, you know, 50, 60 innings. He's going to be in high leverage spots and he's going to be the complement to CNL Perez as the left-hander we can go to for a shutdown inning late in the game. I just don't know that the Orioles are going to go with that short-term play, kind of like what I mentioned with Rodriguez, where it's about the next few years. It's not just about this year. So if the Orioles do think that Hall could be a starter, then they're probably not going to put him in the bullpen. Um, And what Nick mentioned, what I had written in our show notes about starting him back at Sarasota, what I had in mind was a situation like Kyle Bradis last year. Bradis actually did not start the season in Norfolk. He, stayed behind in Sarasota for a little bit, was built up, then went to Norfolk, and then went to the major leagues. They're not direct comparisons because Braddis really just lost time because of the lockout. Um, And I think he would have been in the opening day rotation otherwise. So Hall is not a direct comparison because he does have to come back from an injury. He wasn't starting at the end of last year. So there is a need to build him up a little bit more, but – that could still be a solution, and it's one that doesn't keep him in Norfolk all year. 
it could be that by June 1st, by the end of June, he's in the major leagues. And there's going to be a spot that opens in the rotation at some point this year, even in the best case scenario for the Orioles this season. There's going to be an open rotation spot at some point. And maybe you decide that that's when you want DL Hall up. Otherwise, I say just stick to him being reliever this year. And maybe you roll out the Tyler Wells plan for him in 2024. That probably would be better just as if you're just compete, 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 playoffs, playoffs, playoffs. But man, it would suck to just see him perform well in that role and then still have to be limited next year. Like this needs to be the year where you can build him up. So where 2024, he's him and Grayson are both like you're out there every fifth day. You're giving it your all all season long. So yeah, I don't know. I think I'm leaning towards start him at triple a, but at the same time, I just want to see him pitch in the major leagues, but it'll happen sooner rather than later. Uh, it, you look at the numbers, like, I don't know, maybe it, it's just being in the depths of Orioles Twitter all day, every day. It gets me jaded sometimes, but like DL Hall in a 13 inning sample size in the major leagues was really, really good. Except what one Rocky outing he had, I think he got like shelled there, but I don't have the game log in front of me, but other than that, his overall numbers, I mean, 13 and two-thirds innings, he struck out 12 and a half per nine innings. The walk rate was down to 3.95. And I've heard others, guys like Eno Saris and some others in the national media say, like, actually, when D.O. Hall was in the majors, like, the walks were not that big of an issue. And especially if you want to put him in the bullpen, it, it's certainly not much of an issue because you don't need the precise command like you do as a starter. You can get away with a little bit more down at the bullpen. But you know, he didn't give up a home run. He had a ground ball rate you know, climbing close to 50%. Yeah, the ERA was 5.93, but – the FIP was 1.65. I mean, he was still worth 0.4 war in 13.2 innings. I mean, he's good. Guys were not barreling him up. Let me pull up his baseball savant page here. A 2.6 barrel percentage and major league average 6.7. Like, guys were not barreling him up. They weren't hitting the ball hard against him. Max EV was like 10, 10 miles per hour lower. Average exit velo about 5 miles per hour lower than league average. Expected batting average barely above 200. Hard hit rate 17.9%. Like, I keep going on and on here about the numbers. The numbers looked really, really good on DL Hall. And so I think comfort, and we've mentioned this repeatedly, by the end of the year, I'm sure the arm was done. Like he was exhausted because he hadn't pitched for eight months and now he's in the major leagues. So yeah, if, if you're gonna give me so ridiculous. Exactly. That was the pitch when when he did start pitching, that was the pitch that everybody's like, wow, and he's throwing it all the time. He was just firing it at guys, and they could not hit it. So I think if the numbers look that good. We, we all know how elite the stuff is going to be. Yeah, I can see why the Orioles truly believe in him as a starter, and maybe sticking him in Norfolk is the right idea. But it is I do agree that it is hard. Like If if he is healthy and get a couple innings at the end of spring and he's looking good, and it's down like, all right, are we going to go with D.L. Hall or Joey Crable or Keegan Aiken? It's going to be really hard to sit here and say, yeah, D.L. Hall, go back to Norfolk. But, man, the, the long-term look for him is just – it could be so, so good. Nick, I actually just pulled up Hall's game log, and I find this really interesting. That bad outing that you referenced, I think, was the September 5th, game one of the doubleheader against Toronto. Gives up three runs on four hits in a third of an inning, a walk, no strikeouts. Now, Toronto, as we know, was a tough team. I was actually at Cannon Yards that day. It was incredibly frustrating to watch. But he did pitch against the Blue Jays again later in the year. Um, one inning, a strikeout, no hits on September 17th. His final outings of the season, game one of a doubleheader against Toronto. An inning, two hits, no walks, two strikeouts. So cherry picking to an extent, but there's signs of development there that he faced a tough lineup in September, had a rough day and then bounced back later on and performed well. And he performed well in the bullpen against some tough teams for the Orioles last year late in the season. So, you know, that's not necessarily a benchmark for how he's going to develop this year, especially if he's a starter. But it does tell you that despite not having his best stuff, he was making adjustments at the major league level. Yeah, that's what I I can't read these these lines and numbers are all jumbled here and trying to do this live real quick. So yeah, after that outing, that's what like eight, just over eight innings of work, one earned run the rest of the way, and what two walks and eight, nine, ten strikeouts. 
pretty solid numbers. Those numbers are, are, are wrong. They're not 100% accurate there, but they're very close. Um, you had dominant after that stretch. Like you said, against the Yankees, against the Red Sox, against the Astros. I just wanted to put all this argument to rest. I feel like he's probably the most, one of the most polarizing prospects in this entire system, and I, I need an answer. I need him to go one way or the other. Yeah, and he's one of these guys that, like, I don't care who they have lined up to pitch against him. If he's on his A game, it doesn't matter. Like, he's he's his own worst enemy as far as mm-hmm. – and we've said that a lot as far as walks and stuff. But, like, you could line up Aaron Judge, Anthony Rizzo, whatever, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani. If he's on his A game, I'm betting on Hall every time. Yeah. The walks may not have been an issue, but I will say that, you know, in the, the, the crowd that likes to yell – louder about DL Hall's walks in their defense uh, you know the pitch counts do get really high on him and it, it does take him a while some at bats that, that cleaning that up would go a long way as well and maybe we do see Hall go five six innings to start which even when he was pitching extremely well in Norfolk we didn't get to see that a whole lot because pitch counts so this is a good question here from Yoni and it's a good transition from this segment to the next which is how far can this team realistically go in 2023 um, I've got my own ideas, but I want to hear from Bob first and then Nick. I think we can realistically expect to compete down to the very last week of the season for a wild card spot, um, especially with the more balanced schedule, a young team that should theoretically improve as it goes al- as along as the season goes along. And you can just pull up whether it's through trade at the deadline. You can if you need something, whether it's bringing a guy up who's ready to help you in a certain spot, the depth that we have all over the field. You know, you don't, we don't have any outside of if Adley, Gunner, Grayson really explode this year. We don't have any, like, true all-star level guarantee star players, but the depth is there. And like I said, a young team that should get better as the year goes along. And then once you're in the playoffs, anything can happen. I would imagine I'd be happy just to get in this season, but – win a wild card series and make it an extra round just get that much more experience for these guys and you know have these young studs that'll be around for the next five or so years get them as much playoff experience as possible because 2024 on it's over for y'all yeah i mean i can see them winning at least a series um you know the al east is obviously going to be tough the rays are always going to be the rays I'm not super high on the Red Sox. Uh, I'm, I'm not even, you know, the Yankees, like, we always say this, though. They're always older. They're always, this guy's not going to make it, and they always end up doing it. We know how the Yankees are. They're going to trade everybody they got in their system for somebody. But, you know, the Blue Jays, I know a lot of Orioles fans hate this, uh, but I'm going to say it again. They're going to disappoint as well. But I really love this Blue Jays roster, like really, really love Toronto's roster. Uh, but you know, this Orioles roster is also pretty good in its own right. And like, I know there was that, that article in the athletic, we all know this for sure. If the Orioles are, are playing well and they're in a position to make some real noise in the playoffs, they can trade for whoever they want to trade for. And the best part about this though, is they're not going to go after those rentals either. I mean, that could, maybe that's something that maybe hinders a trade or delays a trade until, you know, next off season. But you know, they're going to go after a guy that's going to make it more fun, I think. They're going to go after that guy who's got multiple years of control. They're not going to be trading for rentals just to make the wild card. Um, so they're going to be able to make this. Yeah, they're going to be able to make a big time trade or two uh, that not only gets in the playoffs this year, but sets itself, sets this team up perfectly for next season as well as they enter free agency. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that where I look at how far the Orioles can go realistic, realistically, I would say wild card spot. Um, a lot would have to go their way internally and externally for them to compete for the division. But I think a wild card spot is within reach. Um, you factor in how close they got last year. And I don't think it's a hot take to say that they may have been in the playoffs if Adley Rutzman had been healthy on opening day and had been there for the full season. Because you look at the difference he made after he got there, and you realize the Orioles lost three out of four at Oakland in April. They had a tough opening series at Tampa Bay with some close losses. Um, Rutzman would not have single-handedly changed those things, but you could see how the team fell into place once he was up. And even if he had gotten off to a slow start, 
then as he did when he was called up in May offensively, what he did behind the plate would have still made a difference over what they got out of Robinson Torinos and Anthony Bemboom for the first six weeks or so of last season. So I think realistically the Orioles probably compete for a wild card spot, could get it. And I think that if they're in the hunt as a trade deadline, look for whoever the equivalent of last year's Tyler Malley is. A pitcher that's not going to cost you a top tier prospect because he's not an ace, but he can make your rotation better. And he's got years of control remaining. I think in Malley's case, he's got one full year left of the twins. So I would look for that kind of move if the Orioles are in wild card contention. Whether they go higher probably depends on them competing for the division, which I just don't see happening unless some things we're not expecting go wrong in Toronto, New York, and Tampa Bay, and some things we're not expecting to go right for the Orioles go their way. And let's be realistic here. They would have made the playoffs in 2021 if they would have brought up Jemai Jones in May. <laughs> so, no. No, it's a great point about Adley. But uh, yeah. I was going to say, all I heard you say was they shouldn't have traded Jorge Lopez or this team would have been a playoff team. But <laughs> 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 No, you're going to have – I think there's a comment there about this team having to start out the gates hot, right? Yeah, that's – and we've talked about that. Yeah, you bring up Adley. This team is also going to have Gunnar Henderson on the opening day roster. Like, that's going to make a huge difference. Um so, yeah, I think this team is going to come out of the gates hotter. And if if there are struggles at the major league level, the guys just aren't cutting it. All right, let's say Adam Frazier. We know he's going to play a lot more than anybody wants to see. But what if he doesn't improve on last year's kind of down year that he had? You've got Connor Norby and Joey Ortiz right there. You're going to have Colton Cowles right there. You've got a lot of prospects, good hitting prospects in AAA. They've already been seasoned a little bit in AAA as well they're going to be ready to, to take control if someone's struggling at the major league level as well, which I don't think we really had that at the beginning of last year, not at least the depth or the quality of prospects waiting in Norfolk ready to go. No, certainly not on the position player side. No. And Ryan O'Hearn is making a case, man. He's making a case to be the everyday <laughs> first baseman in Norfolk right now. So before we move on, we will take a question here from Simpkin Tribute. Uh, kind of talking about the trade deadline a little bit and possibility of where the Orioles could be around that point. He wants to know if they would deal from their surplus of infield prospects. That would be the logical place to start. I mean, because you do have not just a surplus of infield prospects, but a surplus of infield prospects that by that point are going to be major league ready or close to major league ready. So that's the logical. If you're engaged in trade discussions, with the Orioles, that's a logical place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, this time, like by August, Jackson Holiday could be in double A AA or triple A for God's sakes. I mean, this kid is ridiculous. It's just like even these young international infield prospects are going to start rising quickly. Ben Cosme, De Leon. So yeah, it's kind of like put up or shut up. And if you have a whole bunch of guys just performing in double and triple A, you might have to clear out one or two like we did with Daryl Hernandez and got a really good trade in return for him. Yeah, I was just going to say, Hernandez is just the first. You, you'll see another one for sure, at least one or two of these guys, because yeah, you've got Jackson Holly is going to push his way into the upper levels of the minor leagues this year. You've got some other kind of under the radar, decent quality middle infielders as well that can hold their own. So yeah, it's I'm, I'm sure that the Lawyers have already identified who they want to keep and who they're trying to move. And they just hope you come out of the gates hot in AAA and come trade deadline, their value is just as high as it's ever been. So we'll look now at what's been going on in camp so far. We want to talk about the players that have stood out to us. Um, one thing that's been interesting about seeing the Orioles or following the Orioles this spring is that you're seeing a lot of guys that are probably going to be in Bowie or Norfolk get playing time and make the most of it. Um, we're recording this show on Monday, and earlier in the day, Colton Kowser hit a long opposite field home run against the Phillies. I'm not sure if that ball has landed just yet, but you're seeing contributions from guys who are interesting prospects, but then might also help out the Major League roster, as well as some younger guys that maybe aren't prospects anymore, but still have not proven themselves in the majors yet seem to be making the most of their opportunities this spring and making 
very, very strong cases for the opening day roster. I'm going to start with Nick because the guy that he picked out was someone who just a couple of years ago was seen as maybe the top pitching prospect in this system outside of Grayson Rodriguez and D.L. Hall and was very effective at Norfolk last year, and he seems to be carrying that over into the spring. Yeah, let's talk about Michael Bauman for a couple of minutes here. Um, like He's frustrated the hell out of me for so long, uh, to be honest, because he made this big statement in 2019 when he got to Bowie. He had the no-hitter. He showed that he can hold that 95, 96 mile an hour, even higher velo deep into outings. And it almost seemed like as he worked deeper into games, the velo ticked up even when he was down there in Bowie. And the conversation before that wasn't even like, is he a, a starter starting pitching prospect or relief pitching prospect? It was like, is he a prospect at all? And he answered that question in 2019. And now it's been ups and downs. He's gotten hit pretty hard in his time in the major leagues. You know, walks become an issue, but he had the injury as well. And I think there was a lot of Dean Kramer uh, issues going on there with Michael Bowen as well, the, the mental side of things. I don't know, maybe not trusting the body, not trusting the stuff. I don't know, but I see a lot of the similarities there where the stuff is still good, but the results just weren't there. And then Bowman gets to the Trop. They played, that was yesterday, Sunday, right? They, yeah. So they played at the Trop on Sunday, Major League Park, Major League Lights, against the Rays. He strikes out five guys in three innings. The only run he allowed was a Randy Rosarena home run because that's what he always does against the Orioles. But 16 called strikes plus whiffs. More spin on his pitches, max out at 97 miles an hour, average 96. The velo is up across the board on all of his pitches except the slider, but the slider has more movement this year than it did last year, become more, more sweepier, uh, sweepy slider. Bauman's got it now. And remember, not too long ago, he had the highest graded slider in the org. I think it was John Mioli, Baseball America, saying plugging him as the future closer five years down the road with that fastball slider combination. You know, I just think if Major League Baseball hitters pounded as forcing fastball, they've been doing that since he's come up. If he can fix that, I think Bauman can carve a role in the major leagues. But he's 27 now. He's not some young prospect. And I, I don't know. Is this the year that he pops? And is it out of the bullpen? Do you continue to work him as a starter? I think you plug him in that bullpen and you let him ride. Let him cook out of that bullpen. Uh, he becomes your 97, 98. He's throwing 99 miles an hour with that sweepy slider. He can be effective, I, I hope. And, and if he pops, it's, it's going to help take this team a long way, I believe, by solidifying the back end of that bullpen. Yeah, I'm starting to really buy in on Bauman this year because early on you mentioned mm -hmm. Eno Saris before, and he's got his vaunted uh, stuff yeah. plus numbers, and they only need very few pitches to really start to be – you know, trustworthy and, and useful. And I think it was, he was like at the top of the charts as far as fastball stuff goes early on in spring after his first appearance or two. And then after his last appearance at the trap, which he performed really well, obviously five strikeouts, three innings. Uh, there's another grading stuff uh, Twitter profile that was saying his changeup was like elite, elite in that game. And if he's got the changeup working like that, with that velocity, that good of a fastball, and the slider going, like, he's going to be pretty damn good, especially in short bursts out of the bullpen. So, yeah, I'm starting to think we got to find a way to get him on the opening day roster out of that bullpen. And he's a guy that can give you multiple innings, but at the same time he can really ramp it up. And I feel like last year all he had was the fastball. He couldn't trust the location on any of his breaking pitches. And, and if he's corrected that issue, I think he can be a real weapon. He really has nothing left to prove in AAA. I, I just don't see the advantage in sending him back there unless the Orioles simply just don't have room for him at the end of camp. I agree. Put him in the bullpen and see what he can do. And, you know, there's not really any way to look around how he performed at the start of last year. He was pretty bad in the major leagues. But one thing I think was apparent about the Orioles after the first month last year was that you know, we don't know if this team's any good or not. And in fact, at that point, they didn't look like they were going to be very good. But the bullpen is definitely better. Dylan Tate was performing well. Felix Batista looked really good. Jorge Lopez was pitching, you know, probably the best he did all season early on. So the bar was raised, and you just couldn't justify giving innings to Ballman anymore, especially when you had depth at Norfolk. And Later on, when he came up in the major leagues at the end of the year, he looked like he could hold his own. So there's not much left for him to prove at AAA. 
I agree. Let him work out of the bullpen this year. And you can always revisit the starter conversation if you want. <clears throat> but for this year, he'll make a big difference in the bullpen if everything's working for him. I just I also didn't realize he's already 27 years old. Uh, he's he's becoming an old man. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like this is kind of the, the final year for him. But, I mean, he's like 6'4", 6'5". He's got to be 230, 240 pounds. And he's over there throwing 97 we know he can get another mile or two if he's only if you're saying go out there for one inning, you know he's popping 99. Uh, he could probably touch 100 if he wanted to later in the year when when the weather gets warm. Uh, it I just think when you got Tate's injury and we don't know exactly when he's going to be coming back, how that's going to affect him. And you've got guys like Joey Crable and even Brian Baker like really struggling in the bullpen so far this spring. If a guy like Bauman can step up another huge insurance policy there for that regression that I think a lot of people are expecting to come out of that bullpen. And I hope it works for him because man, it's, it's been a journey for Bauman in this organization. Another guy who I think could fill in for some of that regression is a guy I picked to uh, highlight is Andrew, Andrew Politi, the rule five selection who has just been, I mean, I haven't seen him. Does he, has he really pitched? I don't know. I've seen his name in a box score. Uh, seems to be pitching really well. And it sounds like the Orioles are really, interested in his stuff um from what i understand he's got like a really nice curveball and he's got i don't know i haven't watched him pitch but it just seems like he's performing really well and it's it's going to be hard to send him back to boston was it boston right yep. it's gonna be hard to send him back there if he just continues to pitch like this uh, i don't know i feel like you also have, kind of have to find room for him because he's another guy that could give you a couple innings, not just limited to one. And if the stuff is that good and you can steal another guy the way you did with Tyler Wells from the Twins, especially from the Red Sox, I mean, you got to try to do it. So at least to start the year, I think he's got to start on the team. And it's like, you know, I hate to say, is Brian Baker going to start in AAA until he can figure it out and get Bauman and Politi up here? If you got to do it, you got to do it. The bullpen, bullpen wheel turns no matter what. Yeah, I had – Probably looking back, I mean, I probably had like 20 players on my rule five draft list that I really liked, and Politi was not one of them. He just he didn't have that you know fastball that touches 100, he didn't have the extreme ground ball or strikeout numbers, so I didn't really look much into him. It, clearly, the Orioles liked him and targeted him in that rule five draft, but I was really excited to watch him pitch this spring. And like you mentioned, we have not been able to watch a single outing of his, so. Uh, I don't really like know exactly how to break them down. We got to do the thing that I hate the most box score scouting. And we got a spring training box score uh, scouting over here with him, but three scoreless innings, five strikeouts, one walk. I mean, I think that's pretty solid. I guess there's really nothing you can do except just keep putting up the zeros, continue to knock walk, continue to not walk guys force the Orioles hand. I mean, maybe, knowing that he's a rule five selection and you have to keep him on the active roster or send him back. Maybe that gives him a slight advantage. If you know, you're down to two guys, maybe you go with Politi, especially if you can option the other guy for a couple months or a couple weeks. But yeah, I just, I want to see him pitch. I want to know who this guy is, what he's got, what he looks like. I don't even know what his face looks like at this point. With the injury to Dylan Tate, you have an opportunity to at least see what you have in Politi, which it's kind of now why I expect that he's going to make the opening day roster because you have, you know, let's say Tate's out for a month, which is what I think some of the early reports suggested, that he's probably down for at least the first month. You've got a pretty good window there where you can look at Politi and see what you have. And you'll know after that span of time if he's major league ready or not. Now, when the Orioles took him and I was doing my own research into trying to figure out who he was, um, a lot of articles popped up from the Boston media last year talking about Politi being major league ready and how he was a top option for a September call-up. That ultimately didn't happen. And as I think we know firsthand, sometimes that evaluation of how a player looks in AAA versus how the organization sees them fitting into the major league roster are not the same thing. But Politi was really good at AAA last year. Um, there are some outlets, fan graphs included, that have been high on him for a while. So, you know, if you're going to go for the first month of the season without Dylan Tate, you don't know how stretched out by that point Felix Batista is going to be. 
um, give you know, give Politi a shot, see what you have. Yeah, and SLGS Reds said, has Politi not pitched in a stack cast park yet? I think he did pitch at the trap on Sunday. I see he's got, he got five swings and misses, trying to pull That's up, right. like, you know, exactly what he had going on here. Let's see, Andrew Politi, he averaged 94 with the fastball, a little under 94. The curveball seemed to be working a CSW of 60% on the curveball, so that's pretty good. 43% on the cutter, 44 overall. Um, yeah, looks good, but still, you want to see him in person. You want to actually watch him work. And, yeah, it would be nice if, what, three, yeah. only three games left on Masson, but maybe a couple uh, from opposing teams' feeds. So hopefully we get to at least see him once or twice before the spring is over. Yeah, I forgot that he did pitch on Sunday and had, yeah, 16 pitches eight of them called strikes plus whiffs. Like that's massive um, at a major league ballpark. That's pretty cool to see, but yeah, we'll see. I think they have a TV game Thursday or Friday against the Phillies. And it's a Phillies broadcast. I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe he'll get that opportunity. I don't know if that's enough time, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I want to see, I want to see his arm. I want to see what it looks like. Cause yeah, you talk about the numbers. I mean, the guy pitched between double and triple A, he had 69.1 innings, 83 strikeouts, only 22 walks. 50 games. I mean, the guy is a seasoned veteran down there in the minor leagues. We'll see. Yeah, and another guy I wanted to shout out because Nick cheated last week. I learned from the best. <laughs> I'm cheating and giving you two names tonight. Um, Kyle Stowers just looks really good at the plate right now. Um, hitting off lefties. He's hitting the ball hard. And I saw him in person. He hit the ball hard. He ripped a – was it a double or a single today? He, he's been walking. Hasn't hit a home run. Hasn't hit for a ton of power so far, but I don't care. Just keep hitting the ball hard. Get work those walks. Don't he hasn't been striking out a ton. Uh, and lefty on lefty, we already knew he could hit lefties, but apparently Brandon Hyde needs to see it in person to believe it. So at least that's happening. And I think it's pretty much locked up that Stowers is going to make the major uh, the opening day roster. Hopefully get a lot of playing time. And as long as Vavar can bounce back from this shoulder issue really quickly, he's been really really good and versatile as well. So hopefully they both make it to start the year. Three walks, three strikeouts for Stowers, 16 plate appearances. I'll take that. Like, that was a, a beautiful shot he had today. Just put him in the lineup. He is exactly who you went out and claimed and DFA'd and claimed 500 times this offseason, a lefty who mashes. But this guy's actually good. He's not Franchi Cordero. Like, the guy can play defense. The guy improved so much. We've talked about the improvements I don't know how many times on the show. At the AAA level, we're not talking about from high A to double A. At the AAA level, the strikeouts were cut significantly. The walk stayed the same. Line drive stayed the same or went up. More fly balls, more power. He did exactly what you want every prospect to do at the highest level of the minor leagues. And, yeah, I just – I understand – I was going to say babying him, reserving him a little bit defensively because, you know, he didn't look great. But we talked about that, the differences in major league ballparks versus playing, you know, Harbor Park and, or whatever. So I understand maybe as you're fighting for a playoff spot down the stretch, not putting him in that situation. But, man, this year, put him in that lineup every day. He's earned it. He can hit lefties. If we all – if everyone except Brandon Hyde can see that, I don't know what to say at this point. The guy – he's not a platoon player, at least right now. I don't think he should be a platoon player. I think you need to find a way. Santander looked great at first base today. I know there was – he made the comment, no balls were hit really hard to him, but he made a good play down there. He can do it. He can play first base DH, keep Stowers in the outfield. I want to see that. I want to see the locks out there because I think I think a lot of people are going to be pleasantly surprised at what he can do. Yeah, kind of like I was talking about with Ballman earlier, there's nothing left to prove at AAA. Kyle Stowers mm-hmm. has absolutely nothing left to prove at AAA. Um, so put him on the major league roster and – Give him regular playing time. I think that more often than not, especially when they're home and you've got that short right field at Camden Yards, he should be your right fielder. Hayes in left, Mullins in center, and Stowers in right with Santander's D8, I think would work really well. Um, And he is hitting the ball hard right now. We just had a question here from a listener about whether or not Stowers could play left field at Camden Yards. Um Speed arm combination to play left field at Camden Yards. Eventually, yes, but based on what I saw last year, I think he still has an adjustment period to go through getting used to the ballpark 
and getting used to major league ballparks in general. So I wouldn't do that out of the gate, but after he's had time to settle in, I think the speed in the arm would play out there. I just put up his, his baseball savant page, arm strength, 76 percentile. That I think matches what we've seen. Uh, the arm is strong. It, it's good for right field. It can certainly play out there in left field. Sprint speed, 43rd percentile, so a little below average. I mean, he's played center field at co- in college. He played center field a lot in the lower levels of the minor leagues and coming up. He's definitely more athletic, I think, than you'd expect out there. And he's he's made some some pretty remarkable plays out there defensively. But I think he can do it. But, yeah, that arm strength is good enough where he can play any of those corner spots. I think, obviously, Orioles fans feel like Austin Hayes is a little underrated for the defensive metrics just based off what we've seen him be able to do out there, especially in that new left field. But I think Stowers could give him a run for money overall defensively in left field once he gets – used to it obviously like we talked about he's got to get used to the major league lights the major league three-tier stadiums but i think he he's a little more smooth out there i think we've seen him make diving catches and the arm is maybe not quite as strong as austin hayes but it is pretty strong so yeah i think he could play left or right i don't think he's good enough for center at the major league level but i think he'll be at least average to above average in the corners I'll go with the guy that I want to highlight now, and it's someone that we haven't seen a ton of this spring, and that's Nolan Hoffman. Two appearances so far, totaling an inning and a third, including Sunday at Tampa Bay. What has been interesting, though, Hoffman has struck out three batters in that span while walking just one, has given up just one base hit, not allowed a run. He picked up the save on sun, during Sunday's game. Hoffman um, was a Rule 5 pick out of the Mariners' system, before last season, and unfortunately, injuries limited him to just 27 and a third innings across three levels last year, the bulk of that coming at Bowie. However, he did make it to the Arizona Fall League and was very good out there. 17 strikeouts and 12 and a third innings pits against just two walks. What you're going to get from Nolan Hoffman when he's healthy is a really, really high ground ball rate, pitching from that submarine side, uh, submarine arm angle. And he does not walk anybody. So Hoffman, you know, I don't see him in the major league bullpen picture right away. Probably not even in the first half of this year. But if he's able to get to Norfolk and is healthy, that's got to be a guy that I think we could see at some point this year. Just because you know that if you've got a spot mid-innings, maybe even later in the game, where you just need a double play, Hoffman's got to be the guy you would go to. Yeah, I he's someone that absolutely nobody is talking about because he was a minor league rule five pickup and he missed a lot of time last year. We really didn't get to see him pitch much with Bowie, but he had a pretty awesome Arizona Fall League experience. 17 strikeouts, two walks and 12 innings. Like walks just have not been an issue for him at all in his career. I, he's got the you mentioned the submarine delivery. He's tall. He's lanky. There's a lot of movement and winding going on, but it, he locates extremely well. So I would not be surprised at all because he was so effective in Arizona. I almost wonder if you start him in triple a bullpen, if, if there's room, I don't have done like a breakdown here of how many names, there's a lot of potential names, but put him in Norfolk's bullpen. And yeah, if if he's pitching well, you could see him in the major leagues next year. I fully agree. It was really cool to see him get the ninth inning, the full ninth inning yesterday at, at a major league stadium. So, and I thought it was funny though. I think I closed the baseball savant page, but I think, Baseball Statcast registered all of his fastballs as changeups. So if, if you look at that, his baseball savant page, because um, he only throws like eighty six or eighty seven miles an hour. So yeah, those were not changeups. Those those are his fastballs. Yeah, Vivek says mm-hmm. that he popped on the stuff plus model from Eno, and that was interesting to see. And especially because he just, you know, kind of like the Rays with their bullpen, the way they handle it, they like to have like all different angles, different arm slots coming at you that they can go to. Um, and I think he's got two saves in his two appearances that he has because he came in and cleaned up Cade Stroud's mess, uh, the game I saw at Lakeland last Sunday. And, yeah, he came in through strikes, ended the game real quick after Cade Stroud was like, we're not going anywhere. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I love what we've seen from him, and I think it was a savvy minor league Rule 5 pick last year. Didn't, you know, stay as healthy as you would like, but I think, like you said, he did great in Arizona Fall League. He's showing off to the major league coaches here in spring in the little time he's got. And yeah, I think it's good for him. 
Yeah, definitely see what these guys can contribute in 2023, whether it comes at AAA or in the major leagues in some cases right away. Uh, We'll be back next week with more coverage of the Orioles in spring training. In the meantime, check out our social media, including Twitter, at BSL on the Birds. Also, head over to BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com for the latest coverage on the Orioles, college basketball, football, and more. And while you're there, be sure to hop on the message board and join the discussion with fellow readers of the site as well as contributors to BSL. And one note here before we wrap up tonight, um, some sad news after we uh, recorded last week's show, Full Tilt Brewing, where we had our live show last September, is closing next Sunday. March 12th will be their last day. I've got my Full Tilt right here, Hardcore Legend, for those watching at home. Uh, I've made it up there over the weekend. May make it back there before they close down on Sunday, but best wishes to Dan, Nick, and the staff over at Full Tilt in their future endeavors. Sorry to see them go, but uh, we'll always appreciate the beer and the fond memories of that live show that we did there. So uh, if you're in the Baltimore area and looking for something to do this week, head on up to uh, York and Bologna, where you used to go to be a Chevrolet owner. Now you can get a tasty beer for a few more days. Um, and different note, but if you've not signed up yet, check out our Patreon community. You can join for as little as $3 a month and have access to our WhatsApp chat, which is very lively right now. And at the higher levels, 5 and $10, you will get daily content throughout the regular season. Bob, Nick, and I are already discussing some different things that we're going to introduce to Patreon this year. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to On The Verge. That'll do it for this week's episode of On The Verge. Be sure to check out our Patreon page where you can help show your support for the show and get bonus content, including monthly top 50 updates to our prospect list and daily game recaps during the season and much, much more.